Welcome to week three. This is our week on modern hermeneutics. This is probably going to be the only lecture for this week, and it's also probably going to be a fairly short lecture. Um, this week I've given you, I'm going to be giving you a lot, kind of a lot of reading, but it's just um, as I went through everything that we needed to learn this week, it just seemed like the best way to give you, um, give you good definitions of the topics that we're covering. So as an introduction to this, I just want to talk a little bit about some of the bigger themes that we're going to encounter this week. And the first thing I want to do is to define the modern era. So the modern era is basically a space of time that began at the end of the medieval era and then ends around 1970. Um, when I say ends around 1970, it's a little bit misleading because it generally takes a good century or more to move from one era to another. So right now, we're living in that in-between era, the in-between stage, between the modern era and the postmodern era. So our culture, in some ways, is still very modern, but then there's other places where postmodernity is really starting to um, take the front seat. So I just want to go through a few of the characteristics of the modern era that are going to impact the way that people approach hermeneutics. The first is a high value for reason. There's just a um, big concern for the ability of the human mind to think through things factually, to grasp knowledge, um, and to just to see the world through rational thinking instead of through um, myths or through um, superstition. Another big factor is the rise in science. You know that we live in a time where science is considered to be very definitive. Science is the, the go-to answer for a lot of our questions. So this is something that really comes to the fore during the modern era. And it's tied a lot to this idea of valuing human reason and human, uh, the human mental capacity. There's also a new interest in history, um, as modern era allows a lot more access to historical documents, allows travel to happen more easily, um, things like the printing press have hit the scene, so it's just easier to get a hold of written material. There's a new interest in history, and also in kind of sorting out what's objective fact about history, and what's what part of historical records is interpretive um, and is sort of slanted based on the perception of the person that recorded that history. Um, philosophy also starts to take a big role in the modern era. And we'll talk a little bit more about that um, as we look at some of the specific historical or hermeneutical methods from this era. There's also, I'll kind of combine the last two, just this real sense of optimism in the potential of mankind that, um, that just this idea that humans have the ability to just keep learning and they've got the ability to comprehend all of the universe around them and this general feeling that we're constantly progressing and that humankind is becoming better. We're learning more, we're living longer, we're healthier. So there's just this feeling that eventually um, we're going to have everything figured out and we're going to have bodies that we can repair like machines. So within this context of the modern era, there's some themes that show up in modern her hermeneutics. We already talked about reason a little bit and this idea that rational thinking should be prized above things like superstition. There's also um, a major theme of literary theory and really trying to analyze literature, break it apart, understand different components of literature or um, what's gone into creating a certain type of literature. And then we also talked about um, history just on that last slide. So there's a big concern for finding out what in biblical, in biblical studies is 
um, really truth about Christianity or truth about God, truth about the Bible, and what is a product of the historical era that the Bible was written during. And then also an interest in philosophy. So in the next few slides, I just want to briefly touch on some of the modern hermeneutical methods and kind of group them into the four themes that I just looked at. Those themes of reason, literary theory, historical analysis, and philosophy. On several slides, um, I borrowed um, definitions from the Dictionary of Hermeneutics by James D. Hernando. And so if you see Hernando in parentheses after one of the definitions, that means I paraphrased um, one of his definitions because they were good. So first, um, this theme of reason. As humans are wanting to rely more and more on the capability of their mind, they're starting to question what about Christianity, what about the Bible, seems contrary to the way that the human mind um, understands things to be fact. So one of the trends in hermeneutics is demythologizing, and it's um, based on the idea that there's no supernatural power in the universe, there are no supernatural happenings, um, and that many modern biblical scholars considered that any reference to miracles or God's interaction with humanity throughout history was myth, and modern readers should concern themselves only with the lesson that can be learned from that myth. So um, if we look at things like Jesus feeding the 5,000, or we look at Noah and the flood, um, or any appearances of angels, the fact that um, Jesus was born to a virgin, all of those things, uh, modern scholars that are elevating reason as um, as being the highest value humans should um, strive for would say that all of those things that I just referenced from the Bible couldn't have really happened. And so if they're in the Bible, the point of them is just for us to learn some kind of lesson. Um, so, you know, you can look at the story of Noah and you say, okay, so the lesson here is um, be willing to go against the flow, to dedicate yourself to things that you know are wise, like building a boat if you know a storm's coming, and be patient and wait until the right time to start new endeavors, like don't leave the boat before it was on dry land. Um, so things like, like that are kind of lessons that might be pulled from a myth. I don't know why my screen keeps going black, so I'm sorry if that keeps showing up in the lecture for you. Um, and then another major piece of this concern with reason is deism, which deism is sort of a strain of um, Christianity, as it were, and a lot of actually America's founding fathers were deists. And deism is the belief that God created the world but has not remained active with creation. And usually the analogy that's used to describe this is that God's like a clockmaker who put together all the machinery so that the clock would run and keep running on its own, wound up the clock, and then left it to just continue on its own. But that clockmaker doesn't go back and move the hands. That clockmaker doesn't have the minutes move by faster than 60 seconds. That clockmaker just lets that clock run. So when we look at um, the theme of literary analysis or literary methods that are showing up in modern hermeneutics, one of those is source criticism. And you can see the definition there, which I borrowed from um, James Hernando, is that um, source criticism is the effort to determine the various traditions and literary sources used in the composition of books of the Bible. So there's this idea that, um, that the Bible wasn't just written because God told someone, write this story, but that the Bible is a document that was composed over many years through oral tradition, through other documents, um, being merged, written, rewritten. So the source criticism, if you're remembering what we learned about um, redaction last week, source criticism is going to be highly linked to redaction, and this idea that the Bible is a document that was kind of worked on and modified so source critics look for 
internal evidence of the author's editorial work in combining a number of sources. And the emphasis then shifts from interpretation of what does the text say just as it is to trying to find the literary development of the text, trying to figure out what the text might have looked like or what different sections of text or sources were combined to create one text. So they're looking for what that reveals about the motivations, the theology of the, of the author or the redactor who put it together. So instead of focusing on what is this book of the Bible saying to me and about God, they're focusing on what does this book of the Bible say about the person who compiled it. And hopefully that's you know, throwing up some warning, uh, warning flags for you, that that's not what the Bible is about. The Bible is not about um, investigating someone else's version of Christianity. The Bible is about learning who God is. Um, related to source criticism somewhat is form criticism, and again I'm borrowing from Hernando on this definition. And form criticism is the attempt to get behind the written biblical text to a pre-literary period. So that would be, um, as it says there, a, a period where um, things weren't written down, but every, everything was passed through storytelling, through the oral tradition. So to get behind the written text to a pre-literary period when individual units of oral tradition first circulated before becoming part of a literary text. Form critics believe that by careful analysis of the shaping process, one can identify the original life setting that gave rise to a particular form and also reconstruct the history of the early Christian music, music <laughs> movement. And um, here's our first of two German terms that we'll encounter during this lecture, um, because a major place that modern hermeneutics was really taking off was in Germany. So a lot of the theological terms to describe um, literary methods or hermeneutical methods of the modern era, um, theologians discuss them in German. So the term for finding the original life setting um, or the original sort of, um, well, setting is really the best word, but the original context for a piece of um, biblical text is called the Sitz im Leben which is like the, um, like the moment in time, sort of, or in life. So then we talked also about historical methods and this greater concern for history, and you could even see that coming out a little bit in the literary methods that we just looked at, that, in, that there's a concern for um, the history of the biblical text. So with a bigger emphasis on history is this historical criticism, and it's an attempt to determine, to determine the historical and literary details behind a text that explain its composition. So this deals with a whole range of historical and literary considerations, including authorship, date of composition, intended, intended audience, sources used, authenticity of the content, historical purpose or occasion, literary unit, unity, genre and style. So that was kind of a long definition. But basically historical criticism says that um, we have to look at both the history of when we think something was written and then everything that could have impacted the way it was written that's going on in that history, including literary methods as well as a lot of other factors. And here's where we get to one of our other exciting German terms. Um, so another method is called the history of religions, um, but it just sounds so much better in German. And do you see, do you see that crazy long word right there? So this is the word religion. This is like the study of history, and this is school. So it's religion chic. Oh, see, I knew I would mess it up. Every time I read it to myself, I did just fine. So religions geschichte. And so it's the study of the history of religion school. <clears throat> um, and the method behind this theory was to look at the development of the world's religions, particularly those in the ancient Near East, and try to find where maybe something that was going on in 
an ancient Babylonian religion um, seems to connect to something from um, Genesis. So instead of saying that, oh, so maybe the Babylonian myth was based partially in the truth of what God did, instead, um, people practicing, I'm going to go for it one more time, the religions Lichtschul, um, those practicing that wouldn't say the Babylonians got a piece of the truth. They would say, oh, it was this particular theory about the creation story or this myth was circulating all around the ancient Near East. And that's why Genesis might connect a little bit to this Babylonian myth. So they're saying um, the connections between the Bible and other religions come because of um, just the common shared religion, not because other religions might have little snippets of truth in them. And then on um, the philosophical methods are also important. Um, and so the major philosophical theory at the time that impacts hermeneutics a lot is existentialism. And there's a definition that I um, took a little bit from Hernando on, and that's that um, existentialism is a school of philosophy that defines human life in terms of being or existence. This states that conviction that people are human beings not because they possess some spe special nature or essence, but because they exist and choose to live in a particular way. So this kind of started out with that whole, you know, I think therefore I am, and that it's going a step further. I make conscious decisions and choices, therefore I am. So this idea that human existence becomes authentic and is meaningfully expressed when an individual passionately engages in life through free acts of the will. Thus, an existential approach to biblical interpretation is subjective, meaning it's about the individual, and tends to focus on the interpreter as the determiner of meaning. And one of the forms of criticism that came from this was neo-orthodoxy, meaning like new orthodoxy. And um, it's really kind of an unfortunate name for it because neo-orthodoxy is really an attempt to kind of walk the line between um, the philosophical influences that aren't merging with Christianity well and the traditional um, orthodox stance of what is Christian truth. So it's called neo-orthodoxy and makes it sound like it's a new orthodoxy, but it's really sort of half orthodoxy. So this neo-orthodoxy is a form of Christian existentialism that finds meaning in the Bible not from its historical connections, the author's intentions, the fact that God inspired it, or even the literary methods, but instead, instead finds meaning in a moment of revelation that occurs when an individual reads the Bible and chooses to believe it. So um, just so that you understand, this isn't sort of like a coming to faith moment of accepting Christ experience. This is a, this is really much more of a philosophical, um, just kind of a theory about living in our heads and sort of that, um, the Bible is whatever you make of it, whatever you put into it and choose for it to be is what it's going to be, which is different from a coming to faith experience because a coming to faith is about accepting God as he says he is, as who he says he is, is about submission and is about um, coming into relationship with God, not about just a willful choice in our minds. Um, also highly related to neo-orthodoxy is the new hermeneutic um, that is really, it's the same as neo-orthodoxy in that it's highlighting meaning resting in the reader's engagement with the text, but New Hermeneutics pays particular attention to the role that language plays in mediating the interaction between the reader and the text. So this method connects both to literary theories and a psychological investigation of the role of language and how the human brain understands symbols and language and finds meaning, which was a big concern in um, both philosophy, psychology, and um, literary theory at the time. 
So that is your whole lecture for this week. Um, but um, as I'm able to post things later today, you're going to find um, a number of short readings. Um, there's going to be a continuation of what you were reading from Verkler last week, but I'm going to cross out some sections so that you don't have to read all of them, um, because some of them are just much more convoluted definitions of some of the things that we just went over in this lecture. So we're going to go ahead and um, look at some, I think, probably two different texts that uh, help define some of the literary methods a little bit more and talk more about what's going on in the modern era. And then um, I'm going to give you some primary texts, some excerpts from some theologians at the time that were writing about biblical interpretation. And I'm going to ask you to, I'm going to give you some questions or sort of some prompts and open up one of the blogs so that you can respond to a question. And I'll ask you to um, put a response up and respond to at least one other person's response. And I'll give you some more information as I post that assignment. There'll also be a quiz, and I put that in quotation marks, because um, I, d I don't want you to just sort of regurgitate definitions from this week. So I'll probably have an untimed quiz that's um, asking you to do a little bit more application. But I'll try to make that not, um, not crazy difficult. And then, of course, you'll have your drama of scripture reading and your responses to that. Um, so I'm sorry that I don't have things up right now. Um, and I, I would love to be scanning and posting things immediately after I've posted this lecture. But um, some friends of mine had $25,000 of kayaking equipment. They, they run the shop in Reading, stolen. And um, I'm actually... Uh, heading out as soon as I post this lecture to help them recover some things that were found in the woods. Um, so, um, so thanks for, thanks for helping me to be a good Christian witness to some of my non-Christian friends by serving them, um, by hopefully being patient with the fact that I'm not going to have readings posted until later tonight. So, um, I look forward to this week. I think it should be for me, um, a fun week where I get to see you sort of starting to apply things already a little bit, which is um, really exciting to me. Um, I've been really happy with how you've been doing in your summaries and quizzes, and I'm just really excited that um, you guys are really engaging with the material. So thank you for the work that you're putting into this course, and we will talk to you again soon. Thanks.